Uh, I am super excited to be able to celebrate Christmas with you all this morning. I do love all things Christmas. I love the lights. I love the decorations. I love um, everyone seems to be in a better mood at Christmas time. I even love some of the holiday food like uh, like eggnog, right? Like eggnog is, is liquid gold. Uh, maybe you disagree. Just out of curiosity, how many of you like eggnog? Some of you, okay. How many of you are like, no, I would never drink eggnog if it was the last drink on earth? Yes, I'll pray for you. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm totally kidding. It's okay not to like eggnog. I like it. My wife does not like it um, as much. How many of you know, fun fact, uh, or you're like, maybe our fact's fun? Uh, how many of you know what the nog and eggnog, where that even comes from, right? So, f- fun fact, uh, a nog was a very strong ale in England in the 1700s. So, what they would do is they would take this really strong ale that didn't taste super great, and then they would throw raw eggs in it and then serve it to people, which uh, really sums up British cuisine perfectly, right? <laughs> you take something that's kind of gross, nog, and then you throw raw eggs in it and make it more gross, and then you serve it to people. Uh, in fact, if you actually go to Amazon.com and type in British cookbook, you're just going to see this. It says, no, just no. It's just trying to save you. There's no such thing as a good British cookbook. So all things, uh, all things aside, like Christmas, you know, we joke about it, but it can be kind of stressful, right? Uh, in particular, there's two things uh, that we usually feel stress over at Christmas. And, and the first one is we feel pressured to take like the really good family photograph that we then put on a card and send out. And sometimes it's hard to get that photograph, especially if you have little kids in the picture, whether it's your, your kids or nieces or nephews or grandkids, to get them all looking at the camera, smiling at the same moment. It's it literally is a Christmas miracle, right? I saw this picture the other day, uh, and the caption below said, this is how well our Christmas photo shoot's going. Uh, my very first Christmas here, I felt pressured to have that perfect photograph, and so my wife Michelle and I, we have a newborn, and, and we're taking this picture, and, and, and my son was just not feeling great, and so he cried the whole time. And so my wife and I are super stressed sitting by a fireplace like, and my son is, is red-faced crying, and I, we get the picture, and we're like, yeah, that's not going to work. So I went and took a picture of my son when he was sleeping, and I photoshopped his face onto the crying face, and we sent it out. But it still didn't look right, because, like, Michelle and I are like, <sighs> you know, and then my son's like, and so, anyway, we, we feel that pressure to take the perfect picture, right? Uh, another way we feel pressure is we feel pressured about gift giving, you know? Like, we got a budget for gifts, and that's kind, of a, that's kind of a challenge sometimes. And then you always have family members or friends where you have no idea what to get them because they can get whatever they want, and you forget what you get them. And then sometimes you end up giving them the same thing you gave them last year. Like this poor gentleman right here got the... <laughs> he opened up the exact same shirt he was wearing. And in case you're wondering... Uh, Uh, You're like, it can happen to kids, too. I found this picture. What's better than one blue shirt? Two blue shirts for Christmas. Great. Or, you know, you're like, hey, I think think this kid is old enough to get this gift I'm going to give him. So you give it to him, and then you find out they are, in fact, not ready to get the gift that you gave them. So... Gift giving is, it can be challenging, right? Or there's a white elephant gift exchange where there's like a very clear monetary amount that you're supposed to spend and you exchange gifts with the person and, and they blow that monetary amount out of the water and they give you this super nice gift and you've given them, as they're opening their gift that you gave them, you gave them like a calendar of, of mullets or a decorative mug, you know? And, and so they're opening the gift and they're looking at you and you're like, yeah. You know, then you're forced into the age-old Christmas lie of, um, yeah, so uh, here's the deal, uh, you know, supply chain issues. Your real gift hasn't come yet, but uh, as soon as you get, this is just a placeholder. As soon as the real gift gets here, I'll give you that gift, you know, and then you excuse yourself to the bathroom and you're scrolling through Amazon to see if anything will be shipped in the next 90 minutes, right? So gift giving, picture taking, uh, Christmas can be stressful. And, and of course, I'm kidding about these things. The reality is Christmas actually can be stressful, right? Like there are times during the Christmas season where we really are stressed and there's much more serious things happening than like trying to take a perfect picture or trying to get the right gift. And 
if you look back at all the Christmases and you go back to the very first Christmas, the very first Christmas was actually pretty stressful as well. I mean, you have Mary who's a teenager and God shows up and says, you're going to have a baby even though you're a virgin. And so that's like challenging because uh, to be pregnant out of wedlock was very disgraceful. You could actually be killed for it. And Mary can't just go up and be like, well, God put the baby in my belly. You know, like that doesn't sound right. And Joseph didn't even believe her. And so Joseph was Joseph was going to divorce her, but then an angel shows up and says, actually, this is all a a very legit thing. And so Joseph agrees to to marry Mary, even though uh, anyone who can count to nine is going to realize when Jesus is born and when Mary and Joseph got married doesn't line up. And then on top of that, when Jesus is about to be born, some Roman emperor 1,500 miles away says, hey, this is a good time to count everyone in my entire empire. So Mary and Joseph have to hoof it 90 miles, that's a donkey pun, 90 miles to get to Bethlehem. And they give, she ends up giving birth in a manger, not like that probably wasn't like her birth plan, right? And, and then on top of that, like you are now the parent of the son of God. Like, that's a lot of pressure, right? Like, when I brought home my first child, like, I had this sudden realization that, like, I am responsible for keeping a helpless human alive. Like, I couldn't even keep my guinea pig alive as a kid. And all of a sudden, they're like, here, here's a baby. You know, I'm like, I think I skipped a few steps along the way here. You know, there's a lot of pressure. And, and so there's that added pressure. And when I was a younger, I was the firstborn. And my, and, and my parents said that, I, you know, they're jokingly, they're like, oh, you, you're the trial run. We'll get it right, right with your sisters. Like with Jesus, there is no trial run, right? Like this is, you, you got to nail this. And so there's that added pressure. And then on top of that, uh, when Jesus was young, Mary and Joseph had to flee for their lives in the middle of the night because Herod was trying to kill their young child. So if you are feeling stressed this morning, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but if you're feeling stressed this morning, I want you to know, like, stress has existed in the Christmas story since the very first Christmas. So you are definitely, definitely not alone in feeling that stress. But in the middle of this story, right, there's also beauty and there's also uh, God's provision and God fulfilling his promises. And so I, I sometimes think like, wouldn't it be cool if you could go back and just ask questions of, of what they were thinking during that Christmas night, right? Like if you could go up to Mary and be like, Mary, what were you, what were you feeling and thinking when you realized like, I'm going to have the son of God in a manger with animals in Bethlehem. Like, what, what, was your, what, what, what were you thinking or what were you feeling? Or going up to Joseph and like, Joseph, what was it like the, the first time you heard Jesus cry and you held him to comfort him? Like, what was that like? Or if you went up to, to Jesus and you're like, Jesus, this earth is a, a hot mess. Like, why would you come down from heaven and live with us? And you're like, Ken, I don't know if you know this, but um, in the Christmas story, Jesus is a baby, so we can't answer that question. And you were correct, but I will tell you that adult Jesus very much can answer that question. Jesus, if we ask Jesus, Jesus, why did you come down here at Christmas to live with us when the earth is a hot mess? Why'd you come down to do it? Baby Jesus cannot answer, adult Jesus can answer, and adult Jesus actually does answer that question. Uh, He answers that question in John chapter 10. Uh, In John chapter 10, he answers the question. Now, adult Jesus, as we're getting through uh, to where John 10 is, Jesus is having kind of a rough time, right? In John chapter uh, 6, he's teaching his disciples and, and all this, these people, and he starts teaching things that are challenging and that are hard. And in John 6 to 66, it says, at this point, many of his disciples turned away and deserted him. So there's kind of a mass exodus of people that are like, this is too, too much, right? And that's disheartening. And then in John chapter 7, he's teaching the people again. And they're like, you are possessed by a demon. And it says that they tried to seize him and arrest him, maybe kill him. But it says his time had not yet come. And then in John chapter 8, he is teaching again. And he gets the Pharisees and the crowd so angry that they try and kill him. In John 8, 59, it says, at this point, they picked up stones to stone him, but Jesus hid himself, slipping away from the temple grounds. 
And then in John 9, Jesus heals the blind person. The Pharisees scream at the blind person, kick him out of the synagogue. It's a big mess. And then you get to John 10. And in John 10, Jesus gives us the answer to the question, why would you come down to earth to live with us in the first place? In John 10, 10 and 11, he says, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And so Jesus says, listen, I've come that you may have life and have it abundantly. Uh, abundantly is the Greek word perizos. It means uh, super abundant. It means exceedingly great. It means overflowing. And so Jesus says, I've come to give you life that is super abundant, that is blessed, that is overflowing its life to the full. And some people say, well, that clearly means eternal life because what's more abundant life than eternal life. And that's absolutely true. But Jesus says, I, I'm, I, I didn't come to give you life in the future. I came to give you abundant life now. I came to give you an abundant life of blessing, of closeness with God, of contentment. I've come to give that now, and it will be realized fully when you get to heaven. And so it's not just a heaven thing, it's a now thing. And so as Jesus promises us this, I want to ask you a question. The question is this. Would you say that is how you are feeling right now? Would you say, yes, uh, my life feels overabundant with spiritual blessings. I feel content. I feel close with God. I feel at peace. Do you feel that right now? And if you do, that is awesome because that's what Jesus promises to give you, right? If you're sitting there and I'm, and I'm here and I'm like, man, I feel great. I got to worship God. I feel blessed. I feel so content. I feel close with God. This is exactly what Jesus promised. It's great. And, and if you feel that way, that is fantastic. But if you're sitting here this morning, and you're like, I do not feel that. This is what Jesus is promising us but I am over here and I'm not feeling that. Or you wake up tomorrow and we're like, I'm not feeling that. Um, why not? And I'm not saying, you know, I, I love you guys, right? I'm not saying there's, there's something wrong with you if you're sad, like sad things happen in this life, right? It's okay to feel sad. Jesus cried multiple times during his ministry. Jesus is not saying if something's sad, you shouldn't feel sad about it. But what Jesus is saying is like, I've come that you may have an abundantly blessed life. And so if you're over here saying, yeah, that's what you're saying, but that's not what I'm feeling inside. That's not what I'm experiencing right now. The question is, why not? And the answer, the answer is, is because there's thieves. We have thieves in our life and we have thieves in the world. And Jesus says that in John 10, 10, he says, listen, I've come that they may have life, but before I came, there were thieves that sought to kill, steal, and destroy. So there's these thieves that are seeking to steal, kill, and destroy the life God wants to give you. So I have come to combat the thief so that you can have life abundantly. And in this context, in the verse, Jesus is talking about the Pharisees. He's saying the Pharisees and the rulers of Israel are the thieves. And, and as, you, as I just mentioned, the Pharisees and the rulers were trying to kill Jesus. They were trying to kill his message. They were trying to discourage his disciples. They wanted to steal, kill, and destroy the message of hope and life that Jesus was trying to share with the people. And, and the Pharisees uh, and the rulers of Israel, they're just one chapter in, in this problem that kind of snakes its way through the entire Bible. If you, if you look at the Bible, it's an interesting book. Uh, the Bible's broken up into an Old and a New Testament, right? And 75% of the Bible is the Old Testament. And have you ever stopped to ask, like, why? Why do we have the Old Testament? And it takes up so much space. Like Acts 16.31 says, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. And so 
why do we need the Old Testament? You know, if we just chopped it off and tossed it aside, we get the message of Jesus. We don't even need to call it the New Testament. We could just call it the Testament, right? And, then, and we would be good. We would understand like, oh, I believe in Jesus. We're good. So we can cut our Bible reading in half, cut off 75%. It saves so much time. It's great, right? But, but not so fast because the whole thing is important. And here's why. When I was in 10th grade, um, I was in an English class and they assigned this book called The Good Earth. And the description of The Good Earth was this. The Good Earth is a historical fiction novel by Pearl S. Buck published in 1931 that dramatizes family life in a Chinese village in the early 20th century. I got that book, read that description and said, no, thank you. <laughs> I was in 10th grade. I was into sports, video games, hanging out with my friends, and definitely not historical novels about early 20th century farm life in another country. And so I'm like, what am I going to do? This is a huge part of my grade. I know this is before the internet. I'll get cliff notes. So I saw the cliff notes for the good earth. I picked it up. We all know we've read cliff notes, right? If you're a certain age. So I picked it up, looked at it, and I'm like, that is still too many pages to read. So I put it down. I'm like, there has to be another way. And then to my shock and surprise, I had a friend tell me, oh yeah, they made a movie about, about the good earth. I'm like, Praise be. So I go find this movie. The movie was made in 1937, which at this point you're like, did Ken go to school in the 1930s? I did not. This is a coincidence. So the night before the test, I rent the movie. I watch the two hour movie. I'm ready to go, show up, take the test, get the grade back, and I failed. And I'm like, what is going on? So I go up to the teacher. I'm like, hey, I think you, like jokingly, right? Like, I think you forgot to put a leg on my F because it should be an A, you know? And the teacher's like, hey, I think you watched the movie because the movie has a different book ending than the book. And I was like, they can do that? <laughs> that was the moment where I realized that the movies oftentimes don't follow the books exactly. And actually to this day, I still have... I still have no idea how the, the book actually ends. So if you've read The Good Earth, you can send me an email, let me know how it ends. I'm not gonna read the email. Like obviously I'll wait for the movie to come out about the email you wrote me, but at least it gets the ball rolling. So my point on all of this is, is this, right? You need to read the whole book to understand the importance of what's happening in the story, okay? And, and we need the Old Testament and here's why. The Old Testament clearly demonstrates that Jesus we need him and he's important because if you start off in the Old Testament, you have Adam and Eve, they're in the garden, everything's great, it's perfect, they mess it up, right? And, and our relationship with God is broken. And so as you read through the Old Testament, <clears throat> you get to God sets up the priests. And the priests were supposed to be uh, a bridge between us and God. They were supposed to help us get our relationship right with God. But over time, the priests became corrupted and they became thieves that sought to still kill and destroy the message of life that God wanted to give. And so the priests did not work out. So then as you read through the Old Testament, God sends judges. And so then the judges come in and the judges were supposed to rescue protect and save Israel. And so the judges rescue, protect, and save Israel. But over time, the judges also become corrupt and they end up becoming thieves that steal, kill, and destroy the message of hope that God has for people. So after the judges, you read through, and then God establishes kings. And kings were supposed to benevolently rule over Israel and, and lead the people and, and help them walk with God and, and be good kings. And there's some good kings, but the majority of kings you read about were bad. And so over time, the kings become corrupt and, and they fail and they become thieves. And so then God sends the prophets and the prophets were supposed to tell people what God was thinking and what he wanted them to do so that they knew what to do. They knew how to have a relationship with God. 
And there's some good prophets, but most of the prophets were false prophets. So they become corrupt. And over time, they become the thieves that steal, kill, and destroy the message of hope that God has for humanity. And so you get to the end of the Old Testament, which ends with the prophets. And you get to the end and you're like, okay, we have a problem. We need a priest who can fix our relationship with God, but when we try to do it as humanity, we fail. We need a judge to come in and rescue and save and protect us, but when we try and do the job, we fail. We need a king that can benevolently rule over us and guide us, but when we try to do the job, we fail. We need a prophet to guide us to God, but when we try and do the job, we guide people away from God. And so there's a problem the New Testament sets up, uh, the Old Testament sets up, then the New Testament comes along and says, hey, we see there's a problem. And the only person that can do all four of those without being corrupted or failing is Jesus. Jesus is the only one that can fix our relationship with God. Jesus is the only one who can protect save and rescue. Jesus is the only good king who benevolently rules over you for your good. Jesus is the only prophet who will tell you what God is truly saying and what he thinks about you. And Jesus wasn't just doing this for Israel. He's doing it for you and me, right? Jesus knows you and calls you by name personally. Okay, there's, there's 8 billion people on this world. Like sometimes if you ever sign up for something on the internet and it's like pick a username and you go through like 50 usernames before you finally get one that's not in use, right? There's so many people on this planet and yet Jesus says he calls you personally by name. He doesn't just know of you. He just, hasn't just heard about you in passing. He knows you personally and calls you personally by name. In John 10, 3, Jesus says, he, Jesus, calls his own sheep by name and he leads them out. Jesus wants to be all of those things for you. He loves you tremendously. He wants you to be blessed. He wants you to have that abundant life here on earth and in heaven. And he wants you to have it so much that he laid down his life on the cross so that you could have access to the life that he's promising. He's the good shepherd. And he says, the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And, and so right now, if you're thinking, you're like, yes, Ken, I believe in Jesus that he died on the cross. I want to follow him. I believe him in his word that he promises me this abundant life of spiritual blessing. I believe all of that, but I'm over here and I'm not experiencing what I say I believe. So what is the problem? Why do I think and believe this, but then I'm experiencing this over here? What's the problem? You know, like, I'm not following the Pharisees. I'm not, I don't have a bad priest in my life. I'm not following a bad king. I'm not, uh, there's not a bad judge. There's not a false prophet. Why is there a disconnect? And Jesus says, listen, you have a thief in your life. There is a thief that is stealing and killing and destroying the life and blessings that God wants to give you. And here's the problem with thieves. We often cannot see a thief, but we will always feel the effect of the thief in our life, right? An example is uh, I have a, a tooth, or I had, I had a 2000 Honda Civic, a white Honda Civic. How did I fit in it? I don't even know, but somehow I somehow did fit in it, right? And so it was extremely frustrating because the car was broken into four times when I had it. I'm like, it's a 2000 Honda Civic. Like, do you think you're gonna find gold bars in there? Like, what are you doing, you know? Um, but one time it was extremely frustrating because this is maybe 12 or 13 years ago. I was having a lot of anxiety issues and I ended up having, I ended up signing up for this class at Kaiser to deal with anxiety. So I went to the class, it was like late at night. I was tired. The class, at least for me, it wasn't very helpful. The instructor was like, okay, we're gonna practice breathing exercises. Um, okay, we're going to close our eyes and we're going to visualize that we are, we are a flower on the beach 
and the sun is coming up over the horizon and the warm rays of the sun are going onto your petals as you open up and release the anxiety, right? And so I'm, I'm, anxious, I'm doing it, but I'm just like, this, for me, it doesn't work. For other people, it does. That's great. But for me, it, it didn't work. All I could think about was like my head hitting the pillow because I'm so tired, right? And so I got home super late at night, uh, went in, went to bed, woke up the next day. I'm like, all right, kids, it's time to get ready to school. So we walk out and there's glass all over my drive. Way. And I'm like, oh no. And a window got shattered. And I'm like, why? It's a 2000 Honda Civic. But then I remembered I was so tired last night, I forgot to take my laptop bag inside. So now my laptop bag is somebody else's laptop bag, complete with laptop. And so I was so frustrated, but I'm like, well, this is a chance to practice what I'm, I'm a flower, petals opening, <laughs> sun's coming out, I feel good. But really, like all I could think about, I, I envisioned like the person that stole my laptop getting eaten by a shark. And I know that's not the right thing to do, but I'm just like, well, at least I stick with the beach motif, so my instructor's gonna give me like partial credit, right? I was so mad, but here's the deal. I never saw that thief, but I felt the effects of the thief very much and very real in my life. So the question I have for you is, if thieves are something that we cannot see, yet we feel the effects of in our life, what is the thief? that is keeping us from the life God has for us, that is keeping us from the blessings God has for us, is keeping us from the closeness God has for us. What's something that, that we can not see, but we feel the effects of all the time? And, and I'll tell you, the, the thieves are lies. Lies are something that we cannot see, but we feel the effects of in our life all the time. Because when we believe a lie and then sinfully act on it, it wrecks our relationship with God. It keeps us from the life God wants to abundantly bless us with. And it's been that way since the very beginning. The very beginning, Adam and Eve in the garden. Life is great. Um, they are, are blessed with closeness with God, spiritual blessings. God's meeting all of their needs. He's taking care of them. Everything's great. Then Satan comes in, and the first thing he does is he lies. He says, God is keeping you from something even better. God is keeping you from being wiser. If you do this thing that God said not to do, your life is going to be so much better. And Adam and Eve believe that lie and then the abundant spiritual blessings the life God had from it got wrecked. And, and then it puts humanity into this, into this tailspin. And you go throughout the whole Testament, it's just one tailspin after another. And you get to the New Testament, and Paul says the reason why there's so much suffering in the world is because in Romans 1.25, he says, they, meaning sinful humanity, they traded the truth of God for a lie. So they worshiped and served the thing is God created instead of the creator himself who is worthy of eternal praise. Amen. So the question is, if, you are, if, if this is what Jesus is promising, but this is what you're experiencing, then there is a lie somewhere between there and here that you are believing. You might not even know you believe it, and then you're sinfully acting on it, and it's wrecking your life. And so the question is, like, What's the lie detector, right? Where's the Christian lie detector we like bust out and figure out where is this lie I'm believing that's wrecking my relationship? And, and that lie detector, what it is, it's called repentance. Uh, I've been reading this book by uh, Sam Lee. It's called Set Free by Sam Lee. I'm pretty sure he did that on purpose. Uh, he must be a pastor. But he, in this book, he, he paints this beautiful picture um, of, of a, a family that moves into a home, right? They move into the home, and what they don't know is that underneath the, the house are two radioactive boulders that are just emitting radiation, and so the family is getting sick all the time. And so the family's like, well, surely it must be something in the carpet. So they remove the carpets, get new carpets. That's not it. They are still getting sick. So they're like, well, maybe this is an old house. There's lead paint on the wall. So they remove all of the paint, repaint the whole house. They're still getting sick. They're like, well, maybe it's something outside the house. So they go outside, cut down all the trees, remove all the shrubs, and they are still getting sick. And they're like, what is happening? So then they start looking underneath the house. And sure enough, they find these two big radioactive boulders. And they're like, oh my goodness, this is what's making us sick. And so they remove the boulders and then they aren't sick anymore. 
And, and what those boulders, those radioactive, radioactive boulders, are the lies you and I believe that make us sick, that keep us from the life God wants, that keep us from the closeness that God wants to have with us. And we need to find those radioactive boulders that we can't see and remove them so that we can fully experience the life God wants us to have. And, and the way we do that is through repentance. Uh, I think sometimes we have uh, a skewed view of repentance where, okay, we do something wrong, and we're like, oh God, I'm so sorry I did something wrong. And, and we feel bad about it for a while. Maybe we beat ourselves up for a while for a set amount of time, and we think, okay, I've beaten myself up enough, so now I'm going to go to God and say, I'm sorry. I feel bad. I don't want to do it again. And then you try your best not to do it again, but then you end up doing it again, and then you beat yourself up, for, and it can get going in this cycle, right? That's not repentance, Repentance is an exchange. Like earlier, I was joking about the gift exchange. That's what repentance is. You are exchanging something for something else. And, and God wants to give you something incredible, and you're, you're, you're holding a mullet calendar, and you're like, here you go, because um, mullets are sinful. Um, so, uh, and so, so that's what repentance is. It's, it's an exchange, right? It's an exchange. And, and Sam Lee, in his book, he kind of lays out four steps for this exchange to happen. I just want to walk through them with you real quick. The first one is this. When it comes to repentance, you recognize, confess, and repent of your sin and failure, right? We say, this is, this is what I've done, God. I, I lied, or, or I did this, or I did that. And God, I'm confessing to you that it is, it is wrong that I want to make a different choice next time. I don't want to do this. Instead, I don't want to do this. I want to do this instead. I want to make a different choice. I repent of what I've done. The second thing, that one's pretty easy. We get that one, right? We know when we've done something wrong. Second one, it gets a little bit harder, right? It says, receive God's forgiveness without shame, guilt, or condemnation. This one's hard, right? Because when we mess up, we feel bad. It's okay to feel bad, but we don't want to stay and beat ourselves up for days and days and days and feel shame and feel guilt and feel awful. And like, I'm the worst person in the world. I'm a terrible person. I'm no good. And we beat ourselves up for days and days or months or years. And that's not what, that's not what repentance is. Because we don't realize we're doing this, but Jesus is very clear. The Bible is very clear that Jesus says, I'm taking all of your shame, I'm taking your guilt, I'm taking your condemnation, I'm taking your punishment, I'm taking all of it. He takes it to the cross and says, it is finished. Meaning, it's not mostly finished, it's not halfway done, you finish it, it's finished, right? And so if we are beating ourselves up for days and days and days and, and, and just heaping abuse on ourselves, we don't realize we're doing this, but really what we're saying is, I don't believe that it was finished at the cross. I don't believe that Jesus carried my sin, my shame, my guilt, my punishment, so I need to deal with it by beating myself up, and then when I beat myself up enough, then I'll come and I'll ask for forgiveness. Forgiveness is not earned. Forgiveness is a free gift from God. So when you're repenting, you say it, and then you accept God's forgiveness without shame, guilt, or condemnation, so it's dealt with at the cross. Then the next step is even harder. The next step is allow yourself to get a sense of Jesus's presence with you amidst your sin. So you think about what you've done, you go back to that moment, and then you put Jesus in the room with you, right? And you're like, oof, that does not sound fun. Guess what? It's not fun, but it's, it's important. Because the reality is Jesus was there anyway. Sometimes when we sin, we think, you know what? Jesus was probably busy uh, with the war in the Ukraine or something. Or Jesus was somewhere over here. He wasn't there at that moment. Jesus is the good shepherd. His, what makes him good is he doesn't take his eyes off the sheep, which means he was there, right? So he was there when you were screaming at your kids or your coworkers or the person who cut you off. He was there on the phone when you lied to your friend. He was there sitting next to you when you were on your computer. He was there. He saw everything. And, and I want you to picture Jesus in that moment, and he's sitting there with you, standing there with you, he's on the phone with you, whatever it is, and, and, he, and I want you to, to look at Jesus and ask him this question. The fourth step is this. Um, it is ask Jesus what he'd like to sh give or show you in exchange for the sin you're turning away from because repentance is 
an exchange. It's an exchange. Um, Sam Lee, in his, in his book, he says this. He says, um, at, the, at the end of this stuff, he says, turning away from our sin implies that we are also turning towards something or someone else. Often we're so focused on the sin, we lose the fact that we're getting something much better in exchange. We never realize that the best part of repentance is not what we're turning away from, but it's what we are turning towards. And, and so as you picture Jesus in that moment, you ask the question, God, what lie am I believing that's making me do this thing? And what truth can I get in exchange so I can be free from this thing I don't want to do? Uh, let me give you just a couple of examples. In his book, he gives example after example. And, and I'll give you one from the book and one from my life. The one from the book was a lady came to him for counseling. And she's like, listen, every time my kids mess up, I blow up at them. I scream at them. I yell at them. And I get so mad. And I know that it's wrong. I lose my temper. So... I lose my temper. I don't want to do this, but I keep doing this. And so he's like, all right, let me walk you through repentance. Step one, let's repent of this. And she's like, I know it's wrong. I don't want to do it anymore. That's why I am here. God, I'm so sorry. This is not the person that I want to be for you. It's not the person I want to be for my kids. And then he says, okay, you need to receive God's forgiveness. Stop beating yourself up. Receive God's forgiveness without shame, guilt, or condemnation. That was hard. She started crying because she felt like she had to beat herself up, right? So then he gets to the third step is, all right, picture your last blow up. Imagine your kids are standing there. You're screaming at them. You're pointing your finger at them. Uh, now I want you to imagine Jesus is in the room between you and your kids. So she's like, I don't want to do that. But she does it anyway. She starts crying again because we don't like to think Jesus sees us at our worst moments, but he does. And so now he's like, okay, Jesus is in the room with you. You're yelling at your kids. What is it? What lie do you believe that Jesus wants to give you a truth in exchange so that you can be free from this? And she, she, she pictures a moment, asks the question, and she's like, Jesus told me that I am afraid that my kids are going to have an awful future. So every time they mess up, I lose it and I yell at them because I don't want them to have a bad future. And she starts crying again. And, and so he's like, what's the truth that God wants to give you in exchange? And she's like, the truth is that I know that God loves my kids more than I love my kids. And I know the truth is that God is in control of my children's future, not me. And so he's like, that's the exchange you need to make, right? And so she made this exchange and said, I'm taking this lie that I'm in control of my kid's future, that, that, that every time they mess up, I need to stop them because their future's going to be awful. I need to take that lie. I'm giving it to Jesus. And Jesus in return is saying, I love your kids tremendously, and I'm in control of their future, and you can trust me with whatever's going to happen. And so she made that exchange, and she wasn't, she's like, I'm not perfect, but I don't have this need to yell at my kids anymore and blow up every time they make a mistake. When that happens, I say, God loves them. God's in control of their future, not me. And I let that go, and it set her free. And there's example after example of this. And so I get all the way through, and I'm like, okay, um, I'm going to do this. What, why not? So I'm like, I'm thinking through, I'm like, okay, God, what do I need to repent of? You know, and there's lots of stuff. I'm not like, oh, I need to find something. I'm like, that's not a problem. Okay, so, so what do I need to repent of? And I'm like, you know what? For me, a big issue is, is anxiety. And then I have an unhealthy relationship with food, right? And so I get anxious. And then I, I, like, I have this like, desire to just eat a bunch of food. Uh, and so I go to the fridge and I eat a bunch of food. And then I beat myself up and I feel bad for several days. And then I'll be good for a while. And then I'll do it again. And I'm like, why am I doing this? So I walk through the steps. I'm like, you know what, God? I confess to you that, that I don't trust I have trouble trusting you, and I have this unhealthy relationship with food. I don't like doing it. I don't want to do it. I'm not, it's not, I'm not taking care of what you've given me. I'm not being a faithful steward. So 
I'm sorry, I, I, I asked for your forgiveness. And instead of beating myself up this time, I'm like, I'm just gonna accept the forgiveness and I'm not gonna beat myself up. I'm gonna believe Jesus dealt with this at the cross and I'm gonna move forward. So then I went and, and pictured the, the moment, right? So I pictured myself in front of the fridge and I'm like, all right, Jesus, welcome aboard, you know? Uh, so I pictured Jesus right next to me and, and, this, and, and I'm like, Jesus, I'm looking at him. I'm like, what is it? Why am I doing this? Like, why am I doing this? And, and I felt impressed. Jesus was just like, you don't think I'm enough. You don't think I'm enough to handle what's happening in your life or in the future. And so you, this feeling of not having enough, you try and satisfy it by eating a bunch of food. And I'm like, oh shoot, <laughs> that is exactly what it is. But I didn't realize that, right? And so I have this moment, I'm like, you're right. That, that's exactly what the problem is. And so I, I'm like, that's the lie that Jesus is not enough, right? And I'm trying to, and that's the lie I'm believing. And so I'm like, all right, Jesus, I'm going to exchange this for the truth. The truth is that you are enough. And so going forward now, I'm not perfect, but when I start to feel anxious, my first thought isn't like, oh no, what's going to happen? Or my first thought isn't like, where's the nearest fridge? You know, my, my first thought is, Jesus is enough. I don't know what's going to happen in the future. I don't know what's going to happen with whatever situation I'm thinking about, but I do know beyond a shadow of a doubt that Jesus is enough. And I will tell you when I realized that, when God showed that to me, it was the most, one of the most freeing moments of my life. And I immediately thought of that verse in John 8, where <clears throat> in John 8, 31 and 32, it says, Jesus said to the people who believed in him, you are truly my disciples if you remain faithful to my teachings and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. The truth will set you free. Listen, I don't know what lies might be in your life. You might not even know them yet. Like, but maybe the lies that you are believing, they're not causing you to like scream at your kids or they're not causing you to run to the nearest fridge. But if there's a, a lie in your life, it is a thief. And if you're believing the lie, you're gonna act sinfully upon the lie and it's going to block the life that God wants to give you. It's gonna push you further away from God. And so my encouragement to you is, Jesus came to this earth so that you could have life and have it abundantly. You could have rich spiritual blessings, peace, closeness with God. And if you're not experiencing that, then ask the question, where is the thief in my life that's keeping me from what God has promised me? And, and I want to encourage you, spend some time in reflection and make the practice of repentance part of your spiritual journey. And where you sit down and just, you look at what you're doing and just recognize, confess, and repent of your sins and failures. Receive God's forgiveness without beating yourself up. Allow yourself to imagine Jesus in that moment and then ask him the question, Jesus, what would you like to give or show me in exchange for the sin that I am turning away from? If you do that, you will remove the thieves from your life that are seeking to steal, kill, and destroy the life God wants to give you, and you will be free to experience that super abundant life. What makes Christmas, what's so special about Christmas is that Jesus came down to this earth, he calls you by name, and he says, I want to be the one to repair your relationship with God. I want to be the one who rescues, protects, and saves you. I want to be your benevolent king that is looking out for your good, and I want to be the one who tells you what God really thinks about you, and I want to give that to you so badly that I will lay down my life as a good shepherd so that you can have the abundant life you were created by God to experience. And that is my hope for every single person in this room, that we would say, this is what God promises, and this is also what I am experiencing. Uh, will you pray with me? God, thanks so much for the opportunity to, to just open your word. And God, I just pray that if we're living in a house and that there's radioactive boulders, if there's lies we're believing that are keeping us from the life you want for us, keeping us from the relationship you want to have with us, that you would make us aware of it, God, that we would have 
and awareness and, and, and to, to see where those lies are, that we would repent of them and say, God, I'm exchanging this. I'm taking this lie and I'm exchanging it for a truth because I know the truth is going to set me free to live the life you have for us. And so God, as we come to you and worship now, I just pray that we would just celebrate and sing at the top of our lungs because you're the good shepherd. You're the one who wants to give us life to the full. And so I pray that this Christmas season, God, we would take part in that gift exchange where we bring our junk and basically say, here you go, and you exchange it for a truth that sets us free. And we ask all of this in your son's name. Amen. Thank you for watching Hessel Online. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel so that you can stay up to date on the latest content and share this with a friend. If you've been blessed by our ministry and want to support us financially, you can give through our app or click on the link in the description below. Thanks again for watching and may God bless you.